I'm Barry Shaw, and uh, this is The View from Israel. With the introduction of the Biden administration in the United States, uh, I'll be discussing today issues of policy, foreign policy, and how they impact both Israel and the Middle East. And to join me, understand foreign policy, how it works, and how it can affect us here in Israel and the region. I have two very special guests two distinguished Israeli ambassadors to the United States, Ambassador Yoram Ettinger. Good morning, Yoram. Good morning, but I was not, I was not the ambassador. I was an ambassador at the embassy. At the uh, Israel ambassador to the uh, US Congress, correct? Right. And, uh, and uh, amb ambassador and uh, uh, Israel Ambassador to the uh, U, uh, United States and Deputy Foreign Minister Danny Ayalon. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Right. To begin with, I want you to uh, help me understand. Um, it, it seems to me that uh, Israeli foreign policy is set by the prime minister at the time. And uh, prime examples of that may be, for instance, Menachem Begin, Shimon Peres, Yitzhak uh, Rabin, Benjamin Netanyahu, rather than uh, them setting a, a domestic policy and letting uh, the foreign ministry uh, explain to the world uh, Israel's position. However, in America, over the years, it seems that the foreign policy is set by advisors who tell the president what the policy should be, with perhaps certain exceptions, like for instance Ronald Reagan and the uh, and Russia, and uh, maybe uh, originally President uh, Truman and Israel, maybe even John Kennedy and the Russian missile crisis, and perhaps the notable exception, uh, Donald Trump um, uh, globally. Uh, am I wrong with this perception? Uh, or who, what goes on behind the scenes, and from your experience and personal knowledge, how is foreign policy set both in here in Israel and in the United States? Who sets it? Who sets the agenda? First. Okay, so uh, I guess I will start, and uh, Yoram, I hope, will back me up, and uh, certainly he can elaborate more. Uh, I must uh, uh, say here, he has been an excellent ambassador and still is a great ambassador for the Jewish people and the state of Israel. And um, as to um, uh, foreign policy, I, I would say that uh, there are two areas. One is of the most uh, strategic importance to the state of Israel, and this is relations and relationship between Israel and the United States and uh, other superpowers, uh, could be Russia and others. This is almost exclusively uh, is being the, the, the strategy here and the policy is being set at the prime minister's office and the prime minister himself is, uh, is very much engaged in um, not only devising the policy but also uh, executing it. Where it comes to all other countries, uh, the foreign uh, office is, uh, is doing that uh, because of the uh, geographic, uh, you know, the universal uh, uh, presence of Israeli diplomats. Uh, today, we have embassies in more than 100 uh, countries, and uh, they would do the day-to-day, the -day and they would deal with uh, uh, regions like Latin America and Africa and Asia. There is a lot of uh, technical support that Israel has been giving to this country since the 50s. Uh, this is all under the purview of uh, the, uh, uh, the the foreign office. Of course, the foreign office also uh, helps a lot in an auxiliary way in the United States. Uh, we have uh, uh, nine different consulate uh, consulate generals in the United States. So when it comes to issues of uh, public diplomacy, uh, relationship with uh, different sectors of the American uh, society, uh, be it. Uh, the Jewish community, the Afro-American, the evangelical, all this is mostly done by, uh, by uh, the foreign ministry and the consulates. When it comes to uh, the administration or even Congress, it's mostly the uh, uh, embassy in uh, Washington, D.C., which uh, actually the ambassadors mostly reports to the prime minister. And the prime minister has actually the... Um, 
um, I would say, the right to appoint um, ambassadors in Washington, D.C. This has always been the case. And I would go back, um, you know, all, all the way back to even Ben-Gurion. It's not just uh, uh, Begin or, uh, or Rabin. It goes all the way back to the beginning of uh, the state. Okay. Yaram, what's your perspective? When it comes to the U.S., the president sets the agenda, uh, both domestically and uh, internationally, national security and foreign policy. Uh, it is the president who appoints all secretaries and all deputy and under uh, assistant secretaries and even assistants to the National Security uh, Council, and he appoints people who adhere to his own worldview. Uh, he calls the, the shots, and that's very relevant to what we face today, because the entire slate of top national security foreign policy uh, people in the new Biden administration, they all reflect the Biden philosophy, the Biden uh, worldview, the Biden national security and foreign uh, policy. The bottom line, they also reflect the traditional State Department approach to Israel, to the Middle East, to the world at, uh, at large. They are intent to advance President Biden's uh, policies and uh, goals. They are intent to erase as much as possible of the uh, Trump's uh, legacy, first and foremost domestically, but also internationally. And certainly, and certainly uh, they uh, have in mind to advance specifics. Uh, they want to revive the policy towards Iran, namely the JCPOA with or without certain uh, changes as far as the uh, framework of uh, uh, issues, as far as the uh, uh, sunset uh, clause, they certainly uh, do regard do regard cooperation with Europe and the UN as a primary goal, contrary to uh, President Trump's policy of unilateral action of national security and foreign policy. So the bottom line, it's not uh, Secretary Antony Blinken who calls the shots, it's President Biden who appointed Antony uh, Blinken because he knows uh, Antony Blinken very well and he knows that he will follow exactly the Biden's philosophy. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, when I saw uh, President Biden signing a pile of uh, executive orders, mainly uh, uh, removing uh, the initiatives of uh, President Trump, they were all his initiatives, or whether it was uh, the Democrat Party uh, using these to start um, to push their agenda for a democratic uh, four terms. And, and, and when I look at the, uh, through Biden's appointees uh, to the top uh, US post, both domestically and certainly in our issue of foreign policy, it looks to me like more like a, a, an Obama third term, and the list is long. You know, some of the names we have includes John Kerry, Susan Rice, William Burns, Anthony Blinken, as you mentioned, Averill Haynes, Linda Thomas, Greenfield at the United Nations. The list goes on and on. Uh, it seems to me that it's back to the future with the Biden administration. And, and I think it's going to be the same when Biden comes to picking his U.S. ambassador to Israel. Uh, my question is, can you share with us some of your experiences and uh, knowledge on who are the people that will be shaping America going forward for the next four years? And, and let's start, for instance, Ambassador Ettinger with uh, William Burns, head of the CIA. I start with him because it was um, announced over here that Yossi Cohen, the head of the Israeli Mossad, is or has had a meeting in Washington with both President Biden and the head of the CIA. 
Uh, and this was the first meeting ever between Israel and the new administration. And I mention it because Burns had secret talks in the past with the Iranians that led to the uh, Iranian nuclear deal. And he, he said when um, uh, President Trump pulled out of the uh, uh, deal that started imposing sanctions on Iran, he said it was a historic mistake for Trump to pull out of the deal. Um, I guess if Yoshiko is over there, he will probably show him an Israeli perspective. Uh, so, your, uh, Ambassador Ettinger, what, what's your background knowledge you have of, of William Burns going back to maybe the period you were over there in the States? I'm, I've invested some time in reading uh, Ambassador, uh, in reading uh, uh, CIA Director William Burns' uh, writings book. Uh, watching him on television, delivering some interesting presentations. I'm sure that uh, Ambassador Ayalon uh, met him in in person. Based on what I read about him and from his own uh, writing, we know that it was him and Jake uh, Sullivan, the national security advisor, who actually planted the seeds of the JCPOA, the 2015 nuclear accord with uh, Iran. And there is no doubt that he was chosen to head the CIA because, partly because of that involvement in a most critical issue on the uh, map of uh, President Biden's uh, foreign affairs and national security uh, policy. Uh, we know that um, uh, CIA Director uh, Burns uh, has been involved in government and outside government in setting a policy which highlights multilateralism, cooperation with the UN, with Europe, with international uh, organization. We go back to his days in the State Department. According to his own testimony, he tried to pressure different secretary of states to lean uh, more brutally on uh, Israel in order to squeeze more concessions to Palestinians due to his own worldview that an Israeli retreat in Judea, Samaria and a Palestinian state are prerequisites for uh, a peace in the, in the region. Uh, we're not talking only about, about William Burns, we're talking about uh, Secretary of State Antony uh, Blinken, before the election, before the election, he already announced that he was putting the Saudis and the Egyptians on notice. This is not a very customary attitude by uh, Secretary of State to publicly put an ally on uh, notice. And the reason for that, according to Anthony Blinken, and again, it's shared by the other top uh, appointees by Biden, the reason is uh, violations of human rights by Saudi Arabia and Egypt and uh, failure to advance uh, democracy. The problem with that uh, very noble, very noble uh, positive worldview is that it has to be applied realistically. And to be realistic in the Middle East, there is no choice for the U.S. between uh, uh, human rights adhering uh, Arab ally or human rights abuser Arab ally. The choice, sadly, has been for many, many years and will be for many, many years between an uh, human rights abusing pro-American uh, Arab leader or a human rights abuser anti-American uh, Arab uh, leader. And strangely enough, while the new Biden team highlights the human rights violations by Saudi Arabia and uh, Egypt, I don't hear much, if anything, about human rights violation, repression inside uh, Iran. But once again, it's not uh, them that set the tone, it's the president who likes this tone and therefore selected, appointed this particular uh, very, very experienced people. 
I, I agree with you, Ambassador Etchiga. I wrote about this in my uh, uh, research uh, report and article on uh, the implications of a Biden administration on Israel and the Middle East, uh, especially when you mentioned about human rights. Um, Ambassador Ayalon, let, let's carry on talking about Antony Blinken, because as, United, as the U.S. Secretary of State, he will be leading the U.S. foreign policy. Uh, but he was a deputy uh, secretary of state under the Obama-Biden administration. And it seems to me, as uh, Ambassador Ettinger said, uh, wh whatever he was involved in has an aspect of human rights about it. But most of the issues that I listed in my article were actually foreign policy failures. At the time, he said, for instance, that getting rid of uh, Omar Gaddafi would be good for human rights uh, in, uh, in, in Libya. And instead, uh, Libya, when they got rid of uh, Gaddafi, turned into a warring Islamic hellhole that led to the murder of a US ambassador in Benghazi in 2012. What was your uh, thoughts at that time, uh, Ambassador Ayalon, when you were there in America at, at that time? Well, first of all, I think it is very uh, important to, to emphasize that uh, all the, um, let's say, officials and uh, appointees uh, in any administration, American administration, uh, they serve at the pleasure of the president. So he's the one setting the agenda, and according to this agenda, he picks, uh, uh, he picks the people. Uh, Regarding Anthony Blinken specifically, he is not and was not an Obama person. He was Biden through and through. Actually, he was brought to the Obama administration by then Vice President uh, Biden, who had worked very closely with him uh, as chair and as a ranking member of the uh, Senate Foreign uh, Relations Committee. I have uh, met uh, uh, Anthony Blinken. He is a very, very uh, affable uh, friendly uh, and a good-natured uh, person. Um, when it comes to uh, to the policies, he will carry out uh, Biden's policies. And here, what is really um, important to see how much attention will Biden, as president, give to foreign affairs. It's, there are some presidents who are foreign affair presidents. There are some uh, presidents who are domestic affairs, depending, of course, on the, um, what is uh, more important for their own, own agenda and what uh, needs the attention, whether uh, by a crisis or by any major uh, developments. For instance, uh, uh, Jimmy Carter, he was uh, and he was uh, elected on domestic issues only. But then came out the peace and the, the negotiations between uh, Egypt and, uh, and, and Israel, and that brought him to be uh, almost a quintessential uh, foreign affairs uh, president, uh, at least in his one term um, in office. As far as, uh, as Biden, uh, remains to be seen, because I think right now he has a lot of domestic issues on his plate. Of course, uh, not the least is the, the corona, virus and how to uh, get uh, to the uh, um, how to vaccinate um, 330 million Americans starting with the 100 millions in the first 100 days uh, as he um, declared and of course uh, the economy uh, and whatever time left he may have for foreign uh, affairs which brings actually the importance of uh, Blinken and the State Department uh, much higher than maybe uh, before. So it remains to be seen how and uh, Blinken and where will he steer the State Department to. It is no uh, secret that he believes in uh, resuming negotiations with Iran, and uh, but I'm not sure he uh, will be a proponent of uh, uh, the agreement with Iran without any changes. Uh, I believe that he will set conditions now that will improve the JCPOA or AKA the uh, uh, Iran uh, uh, nuclear uh, deal from uh, uh, 2015. Whether it happens or not still remains to be seen. I, 
I, I want to link a couple of things. First of all, the uh, human rights issue, and also um, the research I did was under the uh, the foreign policy achievements or failures of the Obama administration, which had the same uh, people, the same uh, people involved in in uh, executing the foreign policy, uh, which were wrong. Um, I mentioned earlier, we'll be talking about Iran, Palestinians, other things later on, in perhaps another show. But um, uh, if we're talking about, for instance, uh, what happened in Libya, and particularly in Benghazi, when uh, the United States lost uh, an ambassador over there, the only time I heard human rights uh, uh, mentioned was when uh, President Obama uh, sent out uh, Susan Rice to go on all the media claiming that the ambassador was killed by uh, angry uh, Libyans who were upset about an amateur video, which was a clear lie. Um, but again, they used human rights as, as an excuse to get off the hook with regard to a failure over there. Um, but uh, there's another thing also, before I come on to another one, where, for instance, human rights was, was uh, applied to, for instance, the Arab Spring that started in Tunis and led over to Egypt. Uh, and the human rights was given as the a reason debt for uh, the, the American policy in, in both cases, when in fact it had nothing to do with the human rights. Uh, the Arab Spring, as you may know, know, a lot of Israeli advisors, maybe yourselves, ambassadors, were telling your American uh, colleagues that it wasn't the Arab Spring, it was the Islamic winter. Maybe um, uh, uh, Ambassador Ettinger and later you, uh, Ambassador Ayalon, can talk about the so-called Arab Spring and the effect of the, uh, the administration of that time in the relationships with regard to Egypt, etc. Well, it seems to me that the attitude by the Washington DC foreign policy national security establishment towards the eruption the tectonic eruption of violence on the Arab uh, street uh, is uh, a symptom of the very erroneous approach to the Middle East uh, due to the attempt to impose on Middle East reality uh, a Western worldview, which is absolutely foreign to the Middle East. There was never Arab Spring uh, on the Arab street. It has been all along Arab tsunami, but still uh, the State de Department uh, and the president in uh, in US referred to that as Facebook youth revolution march uh, towards a democracy, which had absolutely nothing to do with the violence on the Arab street. Certainly there were people who wanted democracy, who wanted human rights, but they were far, far from control of the violence on the Arab uh, street. This has characterized, sadly, the U.S. foreign policy for many, many years, going back to 1948 and even before 1948. And this also reflects the current policy towards uh, the Iran's ayatollahs. Uh, we are not talking about Secretary of State and CIA Director and uh, National Security Advisor who just arrived to this post uh, inexperienced in global affairs. Those are highly, highly experienced people with certainly very, very noble and good intentions, but sadly with a track record of systematic failure due primarily again to their attempt to sacrifice Middle East reality on the altar of their noble vision, of their noble worldview, which means peaceful coexistence, human rights, and democracy, which sadly are absolutely foreign to the Arab Middle East. When it comes to Iran's ayatollahs, the current team just like the Obama Biden uh, team, and with the same players, with the same players, consider the Ayatollahs of Iran to be credible partners to negotiation. They consider them to be uh, an element which could consider 
peaceful coexistence with their Sunni Arab neighbors and even willing to share influence with their Sunni Arab neighbors. This is a Pollyannish vision. This is a vision which has nothing to do with the fanatic megalomaniacal uh, vision of the Ayatollahs, which is well documented by their track record from 1979 when they took over control, by the way, complement of a failed American uh, policy, which stabbed the back of the Shah of Iran and provided tailwind to Ayatollah uh, Khomeini. The major question today, major challenge today for the new team is, are they going to reassess their own involvement and track record, or uh, are they going to repeat the same very critical mistakes? Uh, uh, Ambassador Ayalon, um, what's your perspective uh, of the um, end results of what they call the Arab Spring as it applied to Egypt with the relationship between um, the Obama administration with Joe Biden as uh, vice president and uh, the relationships with uh, uh, al-Sisi who replaced the Muslim Brotherhood? Well, I would say that uh, th this policy uh, ended up with very abysmal uh, uh, results. And uh, with these the so-called Arab uh, Springs, in uh, Egypt, it is true that the motivation was the uh, deficit of human rights in, uh, in Egypt, uh, unemployment, corruption, and uh, mostly it started by uh, students. However, the Islamist uh, movements, the radical uh, um, uh, Islamists, uh, mainly the Muslim uh, Brotherhood, were just waiting in the wings and they just pounced in the right uh, moment, especially when uh, the Americans uh, did away with uh, Mubarak, saying that he was on the wrong side of uh, history. And basically, the Obama administration backed up the uh, Muslim Brotherhoods, and also when it came to the results of the elections, they recognized the so-called uh, victory by the um, um, Muslim uh, Brotherhoods. At the same time, it was not consistent with their views on uh, another matter of uh, internal, um, I would say, uh, unrest. Uh, just a year and a half before the uh, revolution in Tahrir Square in Cairo and in Egypt, there was this green revolution in Iran, where the youngsters of Iran mostly came out against the, the brutal dictatorial uh, despotic uh, regime of the Ayatollahs. At that time, they were really begging for international support, even a moral support, and especially from the United States, but at that time, Obama looked the other way and he said that this is a domestic internal issue of Iran, so not to be uh, um, inter intervened by the outside, which was a, a sharp construct, uh, contrast to what they did in Egypt. Uh, so, so that brought about the Muslim Brotherhood, it brought about uh, uh, Morsi as uh, the president of Egypt, Morsi from the uh, uh, Muslim Brotherhood, and the first thing he did when he uh, went into office was to re-establish relations with Iran, uh, which was the uh, uh, arch enemy of the United States and its allies in the region. More than that, uh, Morsi was actually turning human rights even uh, uh, more backwards than uh, they were during Mubarak, uh, setting uh, or allowing setting on fire of Coptic uh, Christian uh, uh, um, um, uh, areas and, of course, uh, um, allowing uh, uh, brutal Islamist uh, laws against uh, women. And uh, that was very, very tough. And had it not been for uh, the current president, Sisi, who actually set uh, um, back the, uh, the regime, to, uh, I would say, semi-military, 
uh, Egypt would have been in a much uh, worse condition as it is now. And I remember talking to the Americans where we told them uh, that uh, the choice in Egypt, like any other country in the any other Arab country in the Middle East, is not between Jeffersonian uh, democracies as they envision it or a military regime. It's between stability or terrorism. And uh, this, is the, the, this is the choice. I hope now they will understand better um, the um, landscape here in the Middle East and uh, what are the real important interests of the United States, of its allies, and also how to pursue them. Very good. Very good. Uh, in, in, our, in our next show, uh, we'll be talking more about Iran. Uh, and in the next show also, I want us to discuss, we'll discuss uh, the Biden's relations with the uh, relationship with Israel and in particular with Israeli re leaders. Uh, viewers, this is a show you don't want to miss. In the meantime, I want to thank our ambassadors, Ambassador Ettinger and Ambassador Ayalon. And please join us in part two of this uh, interesting uh, conversation. This is Barry Shaw, The View from Israel, signing out.